everybody to the 61st half year SMF lecture uh, of the Ohio State University Department of Physics. My name, My name is Rob Unshu, and I am currently supervising the chair. Uh, we are I'm grateful, grateful that you are able to join, to join us tonight, tonight and, and experience the excitement excite of our uh, physics research, research in this lecture. lecture. The Alpha SMF lecture has been bringing bring leading edge work of global laureates and other members of the community since 1960. The free public, public lecture series has, has been, been endowed by Robert, Robert Smith, Smith to honor, honor his, his father, father of his, uh, uh, W. Smith. 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 Professor Smith was a was faculty at the University of for nearly 50 years, from 1909 to 1958. He played a large role in shaping our department as chair from 1926 to 1946. And so we so are thankful, thankful that, that we can celebrate physics, physics in his in memory, memory through this Alpha Smith lecture. lecture. Today's, Today's Alpha Smith lecture is Nobel laureate Anne, Anne Lillier from, from Lund University, University in Lund, Sweden. Sweden. Her research, research de uh, her uses, uses lasers, lasers to study, to study the motion, motion of high-speed high electrons. electrons. The, the techniques technique she developed allow, allow us to see things, things that happen as, as quickly as, as two seconds, which is, which an, is an incredibly, incredibly short amount of time, as I'm sure she is going to tell us in her lecture. She has made the previously invisible visible and that is what she, together with our own Pierre Agostini, as well as Ferenc Krauss from the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Germany, Germany received, received the 2023 Nobel Prize for. Uh, let me give you a little bit of feedback on uh, background uh, on Dr. Lullier. Uh, she received her doctoral degree from the Commissariat L'Energie Atomique and L'Université Paris 6 in France. She then held a permanent research position at the Commissariat à l'Energie Atomique before joining Lund University, where she's currently a professor in atomic physics. She has won numerous awards, including the Blaise Pascal Medal in Physics, the Carl Zeiss Research Award, the L'Oréal UNESCO Award for Women in Science, the Max Born Award, and of course, the Nobel Prize. Uh, she also holds honorary doctorates from the Friedrich Schiller University in Germany, and the Université Pierre et Marie Curie in France. A fun fact about Dr. Lullier is that she actually was supposed to give this lecture already in May, uh, but then the King of Sweden called and she had to make that a priority over coming to us. But we are extremely grateful uh, that she is here today. Of course, I could go on, on and on uh, telling you about uh, Dr. Lullier, uh, but you're really here to her, hear her talk uh, and not me. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Lullier to the stage and please enjoy her presentation. Are you good? Yeah, good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. So um, I'm going to tell you about uh, the route to attosecond pulses of light. Uh, just to uh, introduce uh, what is an attosecond, uh, this is a kind of arrow of time, uh, starting from age of the universe, 10 to the power 18 second <laughs> uh, ago, and uh, going to the attosecond. And you have several time scales on this, uh, on this uh, slide. Uh, astronomical time scale, you have the second here, this is the time scale of uh, humankind. Uh, this is mechanical time scale, electronic time scale. Here comes the femtosecond. It's the time scale of uh, motion of atoms in molecules. And the attosecond is the time scale of motion of electrons in atoms. So you see that you have uh, as, as many uh, uh, orders of magnitude between at a second, a second, a second on the age of the universe. So uh, what we, do we do with this at a second light pulses? We try to capture motion a little bit like uh, uh, flashes of, of ultra uh, fast cameras. And uh, in general, you can say that the lighter the particles, the faster they move, time scale for motion of uh, atoms in molecules is the femtosecond. This led to a uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry to Ahmed Zival in 1999 for the discovery of, uh, of for the study of, uh, of this uh, 
atomic motion in molecules, femtochemistry, and uh, to capture electron motion, we need attosecond light pulses. So this is the outline of this talk. Uh, first of all, I will uh, talk about high order harmonic generation, which is the phenomenon that led to attosecond pulses. Then I will uh, discuss uh, the generation of these attosecond light pulses. And finally, a little bit an introduction to the physics that we do with attosecond pulses. So let me start by uh, the invention of the laser in 1960 by Theodor Meinmann. Uh, nothing of the research I'm going to discuss would have existed without the laser. And uh, so this is a picture of uh, one of the first laser, a ruby laser, Nobel Prize for uh, the background to the laser one to Towns, Bazov and Prokhorov in 1964. And we are going to use two properties of laser light. The fact that you can confine light into short pulses and especially the fact that you can have intense radiation. So the invention of the laser opened new field of research. One of them is uh, nonlinear optics, where you generate new frequencies of light through uh, nonlinear optical phenomena. And this is a first experimental setup showing uh, the generation of the second harmonic, where you observe the, another frequency, which is twice the laser frequency. So this is uh, the first setup used by Peter Franken in 1961. And the setup which I'm going to discuss during the whole talk are actually very similar. You need a laser, in this case it was the ruby laser, focusing lens, a material where this phenomena happen. In this case it was a piece of quartz. And then you need an element to analyze the radiation. This is a prism and then a detector. In that case, in these old days, it was photographic plate. Nobel Prize for nonlinear optics went to actually uh, was Nicola Bloombergen, considered as the, the father of nonlinear optics, together with Art Shallow for their contribution to the development of laser spectroscopy. And it's interesting to uh, mention the third Nobel laureate uh, this year was to a Swedish uh, physicist called uh, Kai Sigman for high resolution electron spectroscopy. And I'm mentioning that because as you will see, electron spectroscopy is a very important technique in our field of research. The other field that was uh, open, uh, thanks to uh, the invention of the laser, is uh, something called atoms in strong laser fields, actually pioneered by Russian scientists in the, in the 60s. This is very fundamental. It's what happens to atoms where they are exposed to intense laser light. And uh, the way this was studied by, was by uh, um, simply looking at the production of ions and electrons due to this interaction between intense laser light and atoms in, in a gas. And here are some, some of uh, the uh, results obtained uh, in the 70s actually by Agostini. And uh, this was my thesis work, beginning of the 80s. This is an important result from uh, the group of Lou de Moreau in uh, 1994, not at Ohio State University, but in Brookhaven. I'm right, yes. So at, at that point, uh, we are at the beginning of the 80s. We knew that we could ionize uh, gas by uh, uh, this interaction between uh, atoms and, and the laser. Uh, we were looking at electrons and it uh, was clear that we were also producing excited atoms and excited ions in the interaction. So the question was, oh, maybe we should learn more about this interaction by looking not only at the ions or electrons, but at the light that would be emitted by fluorescence. So uh, at the, uh, now we are at the end of the 80s. Uh, I was a researcher at the Commissariat Energie Atomique in Saclay, in the group of uh, uh, Gérard Nafray. And we uh, set up an experiment where we wanted to look at this fluorescence light emitted by 
atoms and ions. So uh, this is a kind of the experimental setup, very similar to what I, I showed you before. We have a gas of atoms instead of a piece of quartz. We have a grating to uh, separate the different uh, light components and a detector. And uh, these are photographs of uh, the laser that we used. This was a neodymium YAG laser, one micrometer wavelength, 40 picosecond. And this is a picture of this laser. You have the oscillator here. This is the laser medium inside. It's kind of old, actually, uh, laser. The laser technology has really progressed, and lasers really don't look like this anymore. There are two amplifiers here. This is a picture of uh, the experimental setup that we use. So the laser here is coming from the right. You have a lens here, so you have a vacuum chamber here. And uh, we were actually, want, we wanted to look at the fluorescent light, which is emitted in all directions. So we had actually two uh, uh, detection axes one along the propagation axis with a grating somewhere here and a detector, and one perpendicular to the detection axis, grating here and a detector here. The dimension of this chamber is like this. Uh, you can notice that we have a printer here, uh, which was used to, uh, to actually uh, uh, acquire the data. This was old times, no computers, in the lab, so uh, this uh, printer was uh, the pen that was coupled to the detector, and we were rotating the the, the grating, and and uh, the the pen was just following the the signal. So this was old times. <laughs> so what did we see? Well, we did not see uh, fluorescence, and we saw nothing uh, in the perpendicular direction. So I will not talk about that anymore. We didn't see much fluorescence, but we saw uh, high order harmonics of the laser field. And this was really unexpected and really interesting. So this is one of the first uh, spectra obtained in argon gas. Uh, so this is the wavelength of the light that is emitted. And the numbers that you see are the, uh, uh, the order of uh, these uh, harmonics of the laser light. So here, from 13 to 31. We only saw odd orders, and uh, this is due to a symmetry property of the interaction with the inversion symmetry, which uh, prevents the emission of even orders. When you plot the distribution of this harmonic as a function of order, you see uh, a characteristic behavior with a decrease first, and then a plateau behavior, and this is ending with a cutoff. And this was really the, uh, uh, the surprise. Uh, at that time, we were thinking in terms of uh, perturbation theory, where you um, can write the uh, polarization used in the medium is, uh, as a series of uh, powers of the electric field, and uh, in such an expansion, of course, you have to assume that the, the first order is much larger than the third, much larger than the fifth, etc. And obviously, this was not valid because we had this plateau behavior. So it meant a non-perturbative behavior. So if I now uh, look at the uh, electromagnetic spectrum going from radio waves to x-rays and gamma rays. This is the visible part of the spectrum. So in these processes, we start from the infrared, the, the frequency of the light, the laser light is in, in the infrared region, about uh, the wavelength is about one micrometer. And then you multiply by uh, an integer, which is let's say as high as 33, and you end up here in the extreme ultraviolet region of the spectrum. So this is uh, radiation which is invisible to the eye, uh, strongly absorbed by, by matter, and by air. This is why we need to work in, in vacuum, and you saw these uh, vacuum chambers in the slide before. 
Now, just to make a little bit of uh, analogy, uh, I would like to uh, compare these harmonics with uh, uh, harmonics in music. I'm sure uh, many of you uh, are playing some instrument or listening to music or singing, and you know what are the harmonics in music. Uh, actually, it's a, I think it's a very close uh, physics uh, phenomenon. In, in, uh, when you play a violin, uh, you generate not only when you play a certain note, you never get the pure frequency, but you also get lots of harmonics, especially in some instruments like the alto violin. And uh, here, it's, a, it's I think it's a very similar process. In, in both cases, you have a strong interaction between uh, uh, here a medium of atoms and a laser pulse, and here is the string of a violin and, and the bow, uh, leading to this uh, generation of high harmonics. And, and in the case of music, the number of harmonics that you get is really uh, 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 determining uh, the clang of the music instrument. String instruments have much more harmonics than uh, like, like flute or, or other instruments. So this was a little bit of a musical parenthesis. <laughs> uh, this light that we uh, generate is a coherent light. It is not incoherent uh, radiation like you have in, uh, in the lamps here around us, the sun. Uh, it's uh, much more like laser-like, where the uh, atoms emit in uh, one direction and, uh, and, and in phase with each other. And again, you can think about music to, uh, to uh, understand this and the difference between this and this. Um, we have a, a conductor here that makes sure that these uh, atoms emit radiation with the same pace. So uh, what we are, this medium of atoms emitting these harmonics behave like a gigantic orchestra where all of the atoms play together in phase. Now to be a little bit more uh, um, physicist expressing about the same thing, this phenomena is at the, the frontier between atomic physics and uh, nonlinear optics. Atomic physics, uh, this, uh, and, and especially atom in a strong laser field, where you, you need the atom, individual atoms, to produce this radiation. This is described by a Schrodinger equation that you see here for an atom in, in the laser field. With, uh, in this term, you have, the, of course, the atomic potential and the uh, laser atom interaction. But you also have the, uh, you also need to consider the response of the medium to the radiation. Uh, the atoms in the medium, as I said before, uh, in order to have efficient buildup of uh, this uh, light, you need a certain phase relation to be, to be uh, uh, realized. This is called phase matching. And this is uh, mathematically described by uh, actually Maxwell equation, this, which can be simplified to a wave equation as, as written here. This is the equation expressing the generation of, of a field E due to a certain polarization in the medium. Now, at uh, the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, uh, there was a lot of uh, a huge progress in, in laser technology and uh, um, we, uh, there was a ch really a change in uh, the, the laser that were used to uh, produce these uh, high harmonics. So we went into the, the technology of Titania Sapphire, which uh, was discovered in 1986, together with the Chirper simplification, and uh, uh, discovered by Gérard Mourou and uh, Donna Strickland in 1985, leading to a Nobel Prize. Uh, in 2018. And this is a picture of uh, the amplifier of uh, a laser, which was built in Lund by Klaus Joran Wallström, here somewhere, and uh, Sune Swanberg in Sweden, in Lund. So they actually uh, 
uh, bought the first uh, such amplified uh, titania sapphire laser system in, in Europe. And uh, this was really a very nice decision because uh, this really technology was going to uh, impact our, our field and uh, during uh, 20 years, uh, uh, almost 30 years uh, uh, later. So at the same time, there was a uh, progress in instrumentation. We uh, um, build dedicated instruments to really produce these harmonics and, and study them. And this is an example of uh, such an instrument that we built in, in 1991. So this is myself many years ago. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my first two uh, PhD students, uh, Philippe Balcou and Pascal Salier. And so we build this instrument. The principle is very similar to what I have shown you before uh, with a gas medium, gas jet, then some optics to uh, separate the different components, and then a, a detector, which is an electron multiplier. And this is this instrument. The size is uh, like this. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, with these different components. This is the time, beginning of the 90s, where personal computers arrived in the laboratories, really changing a lot how we were acquiring data. And uh, the Titanium Sapphire Laser, which I mentioned before, was working at 10 Hertz, which was a huge improvement uh, compared to the previous laser that we were using. And uh, so thanks to the computers, we could uh, really take uh, data in a very new way compared to what we were doing before. So this was a big change uh, in uh, um, being in, an experimentalist in, in physics. I'm sure many of you uh, remember this transition time. So uh, um, we were asked by uh, the Swedish scientist that you, uh, I showed you before to, uh, to collaborate. This was also the uh, beginning of European collaborations, which I, I think have been very important in our field of research. So we moved this instrument in Sweden to take data uh, with, uh, uh, with this fantastic laser. And, um, I stayed in Sweden, or I came back to Sweden for private reasons. So that's a, a story of, of my life. So I'm coming now to the second uh, uh, part of this talk. I have talked about high harmonics and the progress we have made. Uh, now I would like to talk about attosecond light pulses. What is the relationship between uh, attosecond light pulse and these high order harmonics? The uh, idea actually arrived at the beginning of the 90s. And let me explain to you this idea, uh, which I think is very simple. Um, and I illustrate this idea on uh, this cartoon. So here I'm representing three different harmonics, three waves at slightly different frequencies. This is nine, 17, 19, 21 harmonics. Now let's assume that these uh, three harmonics are in phase at a certain time, which means that the maxima here coincide for a certain time. Because of the periodicity of the process, after a half laser period, the minima will coincide. Another half laser period, the maxima will coincide again and again. Now let's sum these uh, this, uh, three harmonics. You can do that in your head. And uh, what do you get? Well, it, this is called interferences. You will get uh, constructive interferences in this region of time where, where they are in phase or very close to being in phase. And then you, here you have destructive interferences and then again, constructive interferences, etc. You see that the sum of these harmonics is a, a, a series of short light pulse. The light is confined into short time intervals. If you plot the uh, intensities of uh, the light, 
you see this series of light pulses. And if you sum not three harmonics, but ten harmonics, you can even get shorter pulses. And if you uh, look at the time scales, half a laser period of titanium sapphire laser radiation is 1.3 femtosecond. So uh, the, these pulses here have a duration of the order of 100 at a second. And this was terribly interesting. It was suddenly a new time scale that was maybe possible. And it was especially interesting because at the time, the uh, research towards uh, shorter and shorter pulse duration, laser pulse duration, had come to a, a stop. It, it, it has been even called a second barrier. And uh, this is the plot of the evolution of this uh, pulse duration uh, down to, uh, to uh, a couple of femtoseconds. And the reason for this femtosecond barrier is simply the, the duration of an optical cycle, an optical period. Uh, we would like to have pulses with at least one optical uh, cycle in this, uh, in this laser pulse. And uh, the optical period of, for example, titanium sapphire radiation is 2.6 femtosecond. So in order to have a, a shorter optical period, obviously you need to go to higher frequency. The second uh, thing that you need in order to create shorter pulse is, of course, you need a broad bandwidth. Uh, the, the pulse duration that you can get is inversely proportional to the, this, this, uh, this bandwidth. It's an expression of the Heisenberg principle, if you want, or Fourier transform. In order to have short pulse, you need a broad bandwidth. And these high harmonics uh, were high frequency. We are in the extreme ultraviolet region of spectrum. Broad bandwidth, all of this harmonic with this plateau behavior. So the big question was, are the harmonic phase locked? And actually, it was not a trivial question at all. It was a lot of controversy. Controverse. See, myself, I was a little bit skeptical. And it took us uh, 14 years to really answer to this question. So in 1993, there was a huge progress in the physics understanding of uh, high order harmonic generation or after second pulse generation, if you want, with the, this three step model, which provided a very intuitive picture of. Uh, the physics behind, and uh, it was really uh, 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 proposed at the same time by Ken Kulander that you see here, and Ken Schaefer. Ken Kulander passed away just a few weeks ago, so uh, he was really a pioneer in the theory of this uh, uh, physics, and uh, I would like to dedicate this talk to, to him. Um, Paul Korkum. Machet Levenstein, that you see here, and Misha Ivanov uh, uh, proposed a quantum formulation of this three-step model called the strong field approximation, which has a very strong impact in, in our field. So I'm going to ex explain a little bit this model. And uh, after that, I will, I will, especially for the young people here in the audience, <laughs> I will uh, give you an analogy. Okay? So first, the physics, and then uh, kind of light analogy. So uh, what happens is that you have a strong interaction between an atom and a laser field, uh, so strong that the atomic potential is, is, is really deformed and distorted by, by the interaction and le leading to this uh, uh, bending that you see here, uh, time-dependent bending. But at some time in the laser field, uh, the potential is really bent. And this leads to a possibility for an electron that you see here in the ground state to tunnel through this uh, potential barrier. Then the electron is, is out. It's driven by the laser field. This is a strong force. The laser field changes sign. So the electron is driven back. And this is a large excursion. It's typically a few nanometers. 
So the electron then is driven back towards the, the core, and then there is a certain probability for recombination towards the ground state, and in this recombination you have the emission of, of light. If you consider the uh, uh, possible electron trajectory that you can have, depending on the, the time of ionization, you, you can easily see that uh, actually electron, the electron is coming back at slightly different time and uh, with uh, different kinetic energies. So you get here the kind of uh, an electron wave packet with uh, typically a few hundred at a second duration and a few tens of EV bandwidths. And this then is transferred to, to the light pulse. And here you have the emission of this at a second light pulse. So now we understand uh, the process in the time domain. We don't really look at the high harmonics, but we, we see what is happening in the time domain with the emission of an at a second light pulse. Each half laser cycle on one side of the atom and on this side of the atom. And now if you add this uh, at a second pulse, you consider the, the frequency components of this train of at a second pulse, you recover your spectrum of high order harmonics. Now I promised a light analogy to that, and it's a, it's a small cartoon. Uh, this is called the adventure of an electron in a laser field. So here you have a, an electron bound to the nucleus, this is a very strong interaction, and a laser field, strong laser, you can uh, picture it like this. This is an electron in a prism, and on the side there is an amusement park. This is a roller coaster that you see. So the poor electron here would like to have fun. What does he or she, I don't know, what does he do? Go for a ride. Yeah, how? Straight out the jail. Yes, how? Oh. How does he escape from the jail? Tunnel. Yes, of course, he tunnels. Right. <laughs> this is it. Uh, this is in, in Swedish here. This is why it's a K and not C. I'm teaching some Swedish as well. It's very, very easy. You have a K here and a I here, but J. Uh, okay, what happens then? Life is nice. The electron is, is having fun and is accelerated in the laser field. And this alert, it's just having fun. Um, this story is finishing very bad. As you, you might guess, and this is the end of the story. <laughs> the electron is just uh, falling into the prison, which is open, and in this uh, fall, it's, uh, he's screaming, uh, he has a lot of energy, which is screaming out. And this is the um, emission of the light pulse. End of the story. <laughs> okay, uh, so now we are at the, uh, in the 90s and uh, we start to, uh, to study uh, high order harmonic generation and, and really to try to, uh, to see is this fast locking happening, what is the coherence of the, of, uh, of the harmonics, are they phase locked to the laser? And let me tell you about an experiment which I think uh, was uh, uh, important in this uh, process of understanding and getting control on the processes. A study, simple study of uh, the coherence of the harmonics. So this was done in 98. And this is the part of the team uh, doing this experiment, Mette Gorde. Uh, she was my first. Swedish, but she's Danish, uh, student in, uh, in Lund and Ted Hange, I think there's no, his Nobel Prize in physics in, in uh, 2005, 
Marco Bellini from Florence, myself, Claire Lingo, I think she spent a lot of time at Ohio State University. At that time she was PhD student of Klaus Joran Wallström here in the audience. Also, also my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what we did is uh, we made a, a replica, we made two harmonic sources driven by the same laser and with this idea do this emission from these two source uh, uh, are, are, do, do this emission interfere with each other? Is it coherent light? Uh, do we see interference? And this is uh, the simple uh, principle of the experiment. We had a grating here in, in the middle which is not represented to separate the different harmonics. And what we saw was interference, as I hope you can see in this picture. So this is uh, the spatial profile of harmonic 15, showing that the, the harmonics are mutually coherent. Now what we also saw, and this was very nice because it was a confirmation of the prediction of this three steps model, uh, we saw that there are two regions of space. There is a part of the radiation which is collimated, and part which is much more divergent. And we could interpret these two parts as due to uh, very short trajectories. This was the collimated part. And long electron trajectory, this was the diversion part. The reason is that uh, a short trajectory, the, this, the reason is coupled to the phase accumulated by the electron and its trajectory. And in the case of short trajectory, the electron is coming out, going back directly. Long trajectory, the electron is really making a trajectory in the continuum. This leads to different phases, and the phases depends on the local intensity, which depends on, on R, the radial coordinate, leading to uh, different wavefronts and different diversion property of the radiation. Now I'm coming to uh, very important step in this physics, which was the measurement of attosecond pulses. At the end of the 90s, we thought, oh, maybe in some condition we could have attosecond pulses, but it was really important to measure uh, attosecond pulses. And this is what my two coloreates of this Nobel Prize, Pierre Agostini, whom I'm, I'm sure many of you know because he, he spent the last 20 years in at Ohio State University, and Ferran Cross, uh, with uh, uh, this experiment in, uh, in, in Vienna, and then he moved to Garching in uh, Germany, uh, did. And in, in the both techniques that they use, uh, the, the principle is called cross-correlation. Very simply, what they did, they tried to measure the, the properties of the attosecond pulse, using the uh, correlating with the electric field of the laser used to produce these attosecond pulses. So uh, it looks like this. First you have to generate these attosecond pulses and then you send these pulses into uh, another gas and you ionize this gas and you also send part of the laser here which is used to uh, uh, generate the harmonics, and you study ionization of atoms in the presence of the attosecond pulses and a laser field. And you study that as a function of the delay between the pump and the probe. And what you do is you look at the ionization and you detect the electrons. And there are two different ways to do that. Uh, Pierre Agostini used an interferometric technique called RABBIT, reconstruction of at a second beating by interference of two photon transition. Ferran Cross used a streaking technique. Ferran Cross managed not only to, to uh, uh, measure at a second pulse, but to generate a single at a second pulse and to measure its duration. So I'm not going to uh, show these two techniques in detail. I would like to. Uh, Maybe show you a little more in detail the, the rabbit technique, which is it's a beautiful technique. And I would like to show you uh, the setup that we have in Lund uh, to uh, use this rabbit technique. So what we do is uh, we um, 
we separate the laser into two arms. In one arm, this is our pump arm, we produce at a second pulse train or high order harmonics if you want in a gas cell. Then we have a filter here, it's a metallic filter to get rid of the fundamental pulse, which is uh, propagating along the same direction here. And then we focus the radiation into another chamber where we have a gas and when we have a, a, where we have an electron spectrometer, in this case it's a magnetic bottle electron spectrometer. And then we have a probe beam that you see here with a, a delay stage in order to vary very, very uh, accurately the delay between the pump and the probe. And then we study ionization of the gas here as a function of delay between this at a second pulse train and the probe beam that you see here. And what do we see? Well, first of all, let me point out again that so there are really two parts. This is more complicated than the first experimental setup I showed you before. Uh, now we have really an a interfero interferometer here. It's a kind of Maxander interferometer. So we have an attosegon interferometry part, and then we have electron spectroscopy. And this is uh, how a rabbit uh, trace, this is the name, a rabbit spectrogram looks like. So what you see here is electron energy as a function of delay between these two fields. And, and really the information that we are uh, trying to get is contained into the oscillation of some of the electron peaks that you see here. You see beautiful oscillation. And we're looking at uh, the oscillation here corresponding to this arrow. So without going into detail, uh, th what happens is that at these energies, we have beating between the different harmonics. And, and this beating depends on the relative phase between consecutive harmonics. And remember, this is what I want to, to really see, is are the harmonic phase locked? What is the phase difference between consecutive harmonics? So this technique allows us to uh, to, to really measure the, the phase difference between harmonics. This is a bit technical. Let me make again a music analogy here. So in music, how do you know about the time? Well, you have a conductor. It's making this kind of motion. This is a wave motion. Yes, you can use a, a metronome to keep the time, the pace, it's also a wave motion. So I think it's very similar. We, we measure time by uh, looking at a wave that you see here, an oscillation, and the information is contained in where are the position of the maxima of these oscillations. So this experiment, which was really pioneered by Pierre Agostini and his group at the time in, in France, uh, he could measure the, the difference in phase between consecutive harmonic and using this information together with the intensity of these harmonics, he could uh, recover the uh, structure of the attosecond pulse train and measure for the first time pulse duration of here 250 attosecond. Now, I'm not going to present uh, the technique used by Fair and Cross, but it's very related, it's called streaking. The main difference is that you, he was really able to generate using very, very short laser pulse to begin with, only one at a second pulse. So in the first experiment, he could measure 650 at a second. A couple of years later, 250 at a second. A few years later, 80 at a second. Now we, ha we, are, we are in the range of uh, 50 or 40 at a second. This is the record that has been measured today. So uh, just to summarize, at a second sources via high order harmonic generation are in the XUV range, relatively low energy per pulse. We are in the nanojoule range, very often in a train, and unless you work with a really very short laser pulse. Since two or three years, fortunately, we have a, a new 
uh, source of attosecond pulse uh, using a free electron laser. I'm not going to tell you about how this is done, but uh, this is uh, two places uh, among others where you have nowadays uh, attosecond pulse. This is uh, LCLS uh, in, in Stanford and the European XFEL. And uh, the, uh, um, these attosecond pulses are in the X-ray range, so a very different characteristic, much higher energy per pulse. We are in the tens of uh, microjoule level and isolated pulse. So uh, there is a lot of physics uh, going on and a new development that happened the last two or three years. Let me now move to the uh, last part of this talk, which is a brief introduction to the physics uh, that we do with this at the second pulses. First of all, let's look at time scale a little bit. Uh, this is a picture of an atom in the uh, Bohr atom model with electrons turning around the, the nucleus like uh, uh, planets around the, the sun. If you uh, calculate in this model the, the uh, time for an electron in the first shell to uh, to, to go around the, the nucleus, you find 150 attoseconds. So it means that this is the right time scale. Now, of course, this is not how atoms are. It's much more waves around the nucleus than particle. So uh, what can we measure? We cannot see that. But there is something that we can try to see and we have uh, measured is uh, time scale uh, for Ionization process. So the photoelectric effects in atom photoionization. This is a um, photoelectric effect was explained by Albert Einstein in 1905. So how can we measure the time for electrons to uh, to propagate in the potential when uh, after absorption of of uh, light in the X UV range? Well, we use the same technique, this rabbit technique, this beautiful interferometric technique. And uh, we, again, we look at oscillations. And here we're looking at uh, ionization of neon atoms. In, uh, and we try to compare the time for uh, ionization of, uh, of uh, electrons uh, in, in the 2 s shell or in the 2p shell of, of neon, two different shell of neon atoms. And we do that using this rabbit technique and comparing the, the time, the, the, where the maxima of this oscillation are if we use the same uh, um, excitation energy. We can uh, represent that, maybe it's easier using a clock when we measure time. It's always interesting to uh, talk about uh, time on a clock. Uh, an hour on our clock is half a laser cycle. I have talked about that during all my talk. We, periodicity is half the laser cycle. For titanium sapphire, it's uh, 1,300 attosecond. And using this rabbit technique, we are able to, uh, just by comparing where the maxima of the oscillation are, we're able to measure difference in time uh, extremely accurate of the order of uh, 20 at a second. So we can measure the difference between uh, this uh, time scale for photoionization in 2s and 2p uh, very accurately. However, we don't know where these arrows are. Okay, we can measure the difference, but not where they are. We cannot measure absolute phase. And this is an example of result. Uh, ionization of neon in the 2S and 2P shell, you see the, the delay between uh, these two ionization process. It's, it's very small. It's uh, of the order of tens of at a second. This is a comparison with theory, and it was important to do this experiment to really make sure that we knew what we were doing and able to describe uh, uh, also these uh, this processes very accurately. Now, what is the physics behind the result that you see here? 
maybe now I'm disappointing you a little bit because uh, in this case, what we see is really a, a correction due to the measurement. It's the influence of the infrared laser that we use for the measurement, which is leading to this uh, variation that you see here. So not much uh, physics behind. However, in other cases, for example, Argon, where we do a similar measurements, uh, comparing 3S and 3P ionization, we see now a, a very a huge variation in delays. Uh, now we are, you see the variation is of the order of 100 of uh, uh, attosecond. Atos, and I'm showing you this result because uh, uh, here you have theoretical calculation. These are experiments done actually in two laboratories, independently in Lund and in Saclay. And obviously here we have a very good agreement, whereas in this region, which is uh, called the Cooper minimum of uh, the 3S shell in Argon, you have a large discrepancy. Nowadays, uh, there is actually new theoretical calculation that's showing that if you uh, make a better calculation, uh, including in, in, uh, shake-up processes, you actually manage to uh, go down instead of up. I'm showing that to show you that uh, we provide new data to theorists and we look at this ionization process in a different way uh, than before. Before this was uh, um, studied using synchrotron radiation, looking only at cross-section. Now with this measurement, we measure uh, delays, group delays or phases if you want, really provided a new uh, angle in uh, uh, a new type of measurement in uh, spectroscopy. Now, I'm not going to say more, but of course, I think the real challenge of uh, at a second science now is to uh, make this type of measurement uh, in uh, more complex systems, in, uh, in uh, molecules, in uh, liquids, and in, in, in solids. So I think this is where there is a lot to do uh, to, uh, to uh, apply these uh, this, uh, techniques to, uh, to, uh, to measure interesting uh, physics. So to conclude, I would like to maybe uh, mention another application, application not so much about attosecond pulses, but about high order harmonics, which maybe is now applied and uh, which is actually in the ends of industry. And just to introduce this uh, application, I'm showing here, I'm sure you recognize that, this is called uh, Moore's Law. So it shows the number of uh, transistors as a function of year. And this law is saying that this number of transistors doubles every two years. And the question is, how will it continue? Can we continue? And in order to, uh, to do that, uh, first of all, Nowadays, we are at uh, the stage of uh, 10 nanometers, so you need to pack more and more uh, uh, transistors on, on, the, on this computer chip. And also there is uh, now, it's done not only in 2D, but a little bit in three dimension. To do that, you need the lithography technique, of course, and also a metrology technique to control the, uh, what you uh, uh, print. And uh, the uh, next generation of lithography use now not laser anymore, but EUV radiation at 30.5 nanometer plasma base. What are the uh, semiconductor industry use for metrology? And here the plan uh, actually from this uh, company ASML in, in Holland is to use uh, high order harmonics as a metrology tool and this is the principle of uh, such an experiment. The technique is, uh, you, is called scatterometry, is to look at diffraction of this light on, on this uh, silicon wafer. And the uh, idea here is to use the, the fact that it's a broad bandwidth with multiple frequencies and it's of course especially coherent radiation. So this uh, is now in the hand of industry and maybe will uh, be uh, important for future generation computers and smartphones. I hope so.
So uh, if you um, have a little bit of luck, like I did, and uh, happen to be a little bit at the right place at the right time to see an expected uh, process and to study it, you might end up here <laughs> in Stockholm in December and uh, receive uh, a nice medal from uh, the, His Majesty the King of Sweden. And a few hours later, uh, there is a huge uh, banquet, it's called Nobel Banquet, in the City Hall of, of Stockholm. And um, very interesting experience for a French person like me is to spend three, four hours sitting close to the King of Sweden. So you, again, if you are a little bit lucky and uh, you might end up uh, going through this very nice experience. So I would like to thank many people uh, during my career, uh, colleagues, uh, PhD students, postdoc. This is a present research group working in Lund. Uh, they are not dressed like that usually. I just, uh, uh, <laughs> they are celebrating the, the, this uh, Nobel uh, um, event at the same time on the 10th of December, but close to Lund. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, uh, the agencies financing this research. And finally, I would like to uh, thank you. I would like to thank uh, the, the Ohio State University. I would like to thank Lou Di Moro and Pierre Agostini and the group at uh, OSU for uh, um, their scientific contribution to this field, which is huge and also for uh, the, the service to the community and for your hospitality during these two days at Ohio State University. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Lillier, for this wonderful and fascinating presentation. Uh, so we do have time uh, for some questions. Uh, so if you do have questions for Dr. Lullier, please uh, raise your hand. And we have four microphones out in the, uh, out in the uh, auditorium. And I will call on you. However, the rule is that, no, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. The rule is the younger you are, the better the chances are that I'm going to call on you. Uh, so <laughs> please, let's start with some of the really younger folks here, if you have any questions. And then we'll work our way up to the, to the older ones. So I'll get to you, but uh, let's maybe see if, if some of the younger folks do have any questions. Well, I mean, that's at least somewhat younger, but I mean, can we? Uh, well, let's. <laughs> all right. But let, yeah, let's warm it up. While, but, yeah. um, so my question is, when you guys are um, uh, generating the attosecond pulses, are you generating uh, what would be called Radberg atoms, or is that something different for your high order of harmonics? No, we, we are not uh, generating Radberg atoms. We are, uh, um, we are actually ionizing uh, atoms, but uh, in, in, in this process. Um, but no, we, we are working with atoms in the ground state, yes. All right, any of the high schoolers, middle schoolers, <laughs> freshmen? Well, maybe you have to still work your courage up here. Well, why don't we go to him then for now? And, yeah. But please, it, it, it is for, for everybody, especially the younger crowd as well. Uh, it's a very nice talk. Um, my question for you is that you mentioned that it took you 14 years to solve that co-facing issue. Um, it's unclear to me in your talk at which stage you solved that issue. Is it at a stage where you see the interferogram of the two um, lasers, or is it at a later stage? Well, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, first of all, uh, the, we, it's not, they are not complete. We, real, we know that they are not really face locked. There is a certain chirp. So uh, they're not really coming back all at the same time. So, uh, 
But it took 14 years to, uh, to measure it, to understand it and to measure it. At the beginning, uh, we thought actually uh, that um, it seemed that uh, if you look at um, numerics and calculation, this harmonic seems to be completely uh, not phase locked, it seemed to be random. And, and then after a few years, we realized that, oh, but maybe it's because of we have this short and long trajectory and this kind of ruin this, uh, this uh, regularity. And then we, when we realize that, we say, oh, maybe we can remove one of these trajectory and re we recover this almost space locking. But anyway, all of this was a little bit discussion, physics, and it was so important to measure at a second light pulse. And we didn't know how. And the best idea we had was to uh, to uh, use, uh, uh, actually try to do autocorrelation using the attosegan light pulses themselves. And uh, this, uh, this was very difficult. And, and it, uh, there are a few experiments, but it, it was uh, very, very difficult. And it's really the Pier Agostini and Ferran Cross that ma managed to measure attosegan pulses using this cross correlation technique that I described. This was a very important result. Yeah. And, and again, to understand all that and, and to somehow arrive to the method was a little bit a collaboration with an idea by the group of Alfred Naquet in Paris, a theory article. And so to, to uh, form the, the, the first uh, harmonics to measure at the second pulse took 14 years. This is also a message I want to say is that this kind of uh, fundamental research takes time. <laughs> yeah, and we are still at, uh, there's still a lot to do and this is uh, 34 years after the first experiments. So it um, takes time. All right, other questions? And to develop the techniques and yeah. also the understanding. Yeah. Let's maybe go over there first. Uh, thank you for the talk. This was really interesting. Um, so you were describing how you, uh, I'm just following up on the gentleman's question, uh, how you measured this, uh, uh, how you were able to determine the phase of uh, this, you know, this pause. And uh, your description was that uh, you were trying to measure, the way you did that, the way they did that was to measure the phase difference between the two consecutive you know, uh, harmonics, yeah. right? Uh, now, if you, uh, on there you showed about up to, let's say, 37 harmonics or something like that. So if you're measuring the, uh, the phase difference between the two consecutive harmonics, uh, are, you, are you just extrapolating whatever phase difference you measure between the two harmonics up to the 37? Or how does that really work to actually uh, get to the conclusion that uh, you know these are phase lock by just measuring this phase differences. We we do that for uh, the whole spectral range of your attosegan pulse shown here, for example. So I didn't want to be too technical here, so I, I didn't put equations. But so we measure beating between uh, between consecutive harmonics, which influence this uh, oscillation that you see. And now we, this is uh, two harmonics, two next harmonics, two next harmonic, etc. So from we study how the the this oscillation and especially the the offset of this oscillation over the whole bandwidth, and this gives us the the phase difference between the harmonics of your radiation of your atosigan pulse strain. So what we measure this way is. The, the phase difference between consecutive harmonics, you can also call that the, the group delay of the at second pulse. Yeah, I don't know if I answer your question. Oh, yes, it makes yeah. sense. Thank you. All right, well, let's go down here. So you've got this uh, train Get of... Uh, How about that closer? Yeah. yeah, is this better? Yes. Okay, so you've got this uh, train of uh, attosecond pulses, and uh, that train has a certain amount of energy uh, in it. 
Yeah. And each one of those attosecond pulses also has a certain amount of uh, energy in it. Yeah. And my question is, do you see sometimes in the future uh, that one can take these attosecond pulses and superimpose them so that they all come at, uh, as a one single huge uh, uh, pulse with a, a lot of uh, energy uh, in it, uh, the energy that was in all these separate pulses, now in all a single attosecond pulse, with, uh, which contains now all the energy. Do you see a prospect of something like that happening? Well, this is a very interesting suggestion, actually. No, I mean, uh, we, of course, we try to make, uh, we make uh, our um, attosecond pulses uh, more and more energetic. Um, the way we do that is not as, as you suggest. I think it's, uh, we don't have this control, but, but it's uh, to, uh, simply to, to work on the, the, what I said at the beginning, the, the, to have more and more atoms contributing to this, uh, to this emission. And we do that by uh, uh, using more and more intense laser, for example, and, and increasing the, this uh, 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 number of atoms contributing in phase to the process. Uh, but it's, um, we're still working on it, actually, <laughs> to, to optimize this, this process. So what I hear you say is that uh, you're working right now on increasing the amount of uh, energy, the efficiency of, of putting energy into, uh, into these uh, pulses, yes. but not as yet trying to, to uh, put move them those, uh, yeah, put them all together into a, a single one. That, that's something for the future. Yes, uh, I mean, the, what, or, there is one direction is to, uh, to uh, again, generate only one. Um, but it's not, uh, no, what you are suggesting, I don't think anyone is, is doing that. As far as I know, I, I, uh, it's a very nice idea. <laughs> okay, other questions? One all the way back there. You mentioned Moore's law of accelerating returns, and then I guess by that, uh, Kurzweil's singularity. Do you see any ethical concerns with this technology, or how do you see this technology playing out in the future? Can, can you repeat your question? Uh, yeah, as we, you mentioned Moore's law of accelerating returns, and I guess as we approach that point, um, how do you see this technology playing out in that, uh, in that sort of yeah, I mean, one uh, way to exploit this, uh, which was done actually by Lou Demoreau, was to extend uh, uh, this to, uh, to uh, uh, sh using laser with longer wavelengths. And in this case, you, you increase this excursion to uh, you increase the, the length and you can get uh, higher kinetic energy uh, coming back. So using uh, longer laser wavelengths, you can get higher photon energy. So, th and y there are also techniques to, uh, to use different laser, laser field to, to manipulate this process. So, uh, there is a whole uh, zoo of techniques to control, try to control this, uh, this process, this uh, uh, ionization going into continuum, going back. So, yes, a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas and uh, a lot of you can also use this to uh, to learn more about uh, the system that is generating the the radiation, the harmonics. If you don't use uh, uh, simple atoms, you can use molecules, and you got information on on this by looking at the light which is which is emitted. So a lot of things you can do. Hi, um, uh, question. Yeah, I have a. A question on your very first experiment, experiment where you were using printer to record the data. So you, you mentioned you were using greeting to see different orders from a higher order generation, but what you learned from optics class that if you use a diffraction greeting, you will get different orders of, it, like you see a lot of peaks from the same wavelength. So my question is, how did you know that the data you recorded was uh, from different wavelengths instead of different diffraction orders from the greeting? 
no, I, I mean, uh, it, it was very clear for almost like a half an hour after the first data that this was uh, harmonics of the, of the laser because we could, uh, I mean, it, simple relation. But I mean, in many experiments, you can see the, the second orders actually. Uh, so this is something we see very, very often, but you recognize the, the, the peaks corresponding to uh, diffraction in, in the second order. So, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so maybe we should take about three or so more questions. Let's go back there. Oh, uh, so you talked about how the times of these pulses have slowly gotten shorter over time as with more technology. Do you think there is a limit to how small of time these pulses can get? And uh, do you think it'll get smaller in the future? This is a very good question. Uh, I think we can probably get to uh, shorter pulses because we, we know how to, uh, if you use this particular mid-infrared radiation, you can, use, you can get very long plateau, so very large bandwidths. But uh, I think the difficulty is to, uh, to keep a reasonably phase locking, to make all of these frequency components to be reasonably in phase. So I think this is the, it's more a technical limitation if you want, physics limitation, but Maybe we can compensate for it, but it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I think there is no fundamental limit for a while. But you need to make these huge bandwidths uh, yeah, be reasonably uh, synchronized. Thank you. All right. I think we have a question back there. Hi. Um, thank you for the nice talk, and congratulations. Oh, OK. Yeah, let's take you first. Yeah, I, I point behind you, but we can take you first and oh, then okay. go back there. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, I have a very naive question. Uh, so the work that you guys did, uh, along with the two other laureates, I mean, the, the work that was done for which you were given the Nobel Prize, that was like almost uh, more than a decade ago. Has there been like any, any substantial like, you know, improvement in terms of uh, engineering or like you know, technology that has like, you know, changed the, the, the entire like, you know, premise of this field? drastically uh, between this work that was done like you know before 2000 and now which is like almost 20 years yeah it's actually more than 30 years ago the, the first experiment i would say there has been progress uh, a lot uh, during all of this year both uh, and this is what I, I was i've been trying to uh, to show progress in laser and there are still huge progress nowadays using a uh, iterbium type of laser system as you have in at the Nexus facility, progress in instrumentation, progress in theory, very important. I mean, uh, this Nobel Prize is awarded to, to, uh, exper ex for experimental work, but uh, theories have had a very important role. And, uh, and I think what I like very much with this physics is that even now we're still learning. Uh, we're still learning how to control, how to improve. Uh, and, and we're not only, uh, you know, making uh, uh, small steps in terms of technology, we, we're really still learning about, about the physics. So it's, I think, very rich physics. So I would say uh, constant improvement with uh, very important steps in 93 uh, with the understanding, 2001 with the measurement. And now we, we are going towards application, but we're still working on uh, on uh, actually on the, on the source themselves. Yeah. yeah, I think back okay. there. No, but so. Uh, uh, maybe it's kind of a, an irrelevant question, but uh, how fast must the pulses be to understand the true nature of quantum physics? Or maybe in other words, um, how would this type of experimentation help us in interpreting quantum theory? Um, that's a difficult question. Um, uh, I can answer one way. One direction of uh, this research is actually towards quantum physics. And what we try to, uh, so here what I showed you is we measure the uh, um, delays of photoelectron. We actually measure the, the, the phase of this electron wave. This is what we measure, amplitude and phase. And recently we realized that, okay, in some case, 
so this applies that this electron wave packet is fully coherent, and this is not the case all the time. And so we realized that, and now we're developing techniques to uh, actually measure the, the quantum, not only the wave property of the electron, but the quantum property of the electron. We measure its density matrix. And, uh, uh, and this density matrix is, is influenced by, by uh, if there is entanglement or not between ion and electron. So we're really going towards quantum optics type of question. If we are going to learn new things about quantum physics, I don't know, but I think it's a very interesting uh, direction of our field of research is really look at the quantum property of, of the electron. So oh. this is my answer to your question. All right, we take one last question here in the front. Yeah. Um, so earlier you were talking about how like uh, different increments of time can be used to like measure stuff at a different scale. So I was wondering, is there some, do you believe there's a limit to like the practicality of measuring smaller and smaller time increments? The practicality, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the, the, uh, for example, if we, uh, um, first of all, if we go to uh, electrons which are more deep into the atoms, I think then you need a shorter time scale. Uh, then at some point you go to nuclei, maybe you need even shorter time scale. But yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> we'll see. All right, I think uh, with that, uh, let's thank Dr. Lullier one more time for this fantastic presentation. I also, I also would like to present you uh, this plaque here, uh, which is a list of the names of all the Alfred Smith lecturers, uh, including some of your fellow uh, Nobel laureates, including some of them that actually showed up in your talk. Uh, okay. So thank you very much for thank coming you. and giving this lecture. It's, really it's, it's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should I hold on to it for you? And... Thank you. All right. So with this, I would like to thank you for coming and enjoying this evening of physics uh, with us. Uh, before saying goodbye, I also would like to point out it really takes a village to put an event like this together. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody in the physics department who has worked on this uh, to, to make this a success. Uh, and again, thank you for you all to, to come out tonight for this wonderful lecture. Okay.